Magento. I'm so honored to be back here with such an amazing community of passionate, intelligent, and fun professionals. I can't believe I have been in the space 20 years, so thanks for letting me be around this long. You know, it's an amazing community. Um, let's get started here. I feel like a little sizzle reel to wake us up. So my name again is Heather Nigro. I am the CEO and founder of Moxie Consulting, and I am so passionate about working with merchants and retailers. I love, love, love empowering uh, retailers to make the right decisions. And after working on the agency side, as Marcia mentioned earlier, and the retailer side, I found that there was a gap in space of knowledge and really wanted to focus on the three pillars of what I consider e-commerce success for merchants, which is strategizing, optimizing, and then maximizing to drive revenue. We've worked with some of the most amazing brands in B2B and B2C retail, and I am obsessed with our clients as well as all of the beautiful products that they carry. Even B2B companies that sell cables and connectors, I get excited about. So today, I can't wait to educate you on data and really taking a humanistic approach to data for merchants. And I want all of you to think about for one second here. Imagine a world where data doesn't exist. Actually, I think we're living in that world right now because data does not exist until we create the placeholder for it. And it is up to us to create kind of this path and strategy around data and data capture. And it truly is just a placeholder for a bigger narrative, a bigger story. This quote from Mark Twain says it all. Data is like garbage. You better know what you're going to do with it before you collect it. And I know that there are many merchants here who are absolutely drowning in data. Most merchants, on average, have about 14 different data sets that they are pulling in to their customer experience. And um, between marketers and warehouse personnel and people that are planning inventory and allocation, Everyone is just drowning in this information, and it's very difficult to digest this and understand what is it that we're supposed to be doing with data. Marcia mentioned earlier that I'm a photographer, and I do like to just pair that sorting through data is like taking pictures, and what you focus on is what develops. So I think that it's important when you are putting together these different data sets as a merchant that you think about what is my intention? Am I looking to understand why my customers might be frustrated, what excites them, what delights them, and thinking about putting together data measurement that will support that conversation more richly. Because otherwise, we're just throwing numbers at each other and not understanding the true story of the customer. And what I love most about capturing data is reading in between the lines, because there's always a deeper story that comes to mind when you're looking at data and data analytics. And you guys will have to ask me later about these two photos. Um, they were unique pictures that I did not expect to capture, but I saw something that others didn't. And I think that that's what I would like to empower those in the room to think about is, how can I push the conversation further to understand the story of my customer? So data humanism. The revolution will be visualized, and data humanism truly is a modern concept. It's currently being taught at universities like MIT and Yale, and it's for the exact challenges that I just mentioned, that retailers are swimming in numbers, they don't understand to do, um, what to do with this data, and how to best tell the story. Most of us are just looking at demographics. We're looking at someone's age. We're looking at their gender. We're looking at how much money they make. But there is a bigger story and psychology that comes along with understanding the true unspoken conversation of the customer. And I think 
part about uh, data humanism that is most exciting is that you can think about the psychology of what drives someone and what they are passionate about or even you know, frustrated about in their experiences, whether it is purchasing an item or the consideration of a purchase. Humanistic data, personas, and user journeys really provide actionable insights, and it's a wonderful roadmap that tells a, a truly a rich story. Um, we really don't know our buyers that well. I, I think that's one of the things I constantly hear from merchants is, well, we have an idea of who our customers are, but we're not really 100% sure. We have assumptions through surveys. Um, we've looked at our Google Analytics. We've even seen their purchase cycle. But they don't necessarily understand the psychology of what makes them tick. Experiencing mapping is its own way to uncover the truth and chart the course of the shopper journey. And being able to use this map you know, through this fluid cycle, I think, is really key in driving tailor success. So I want to share with you this really cool case study, which is the super nerd in me coming out. Uh, we had the opportunity to work with the largest manufacturer of pinball machines in the world. So I don't know if anyone here likes pinball, but um, oh, I see right here, these guys right here. Maybe you know this story that pinball actually used to be illegal. It was considered a form of gambling, and it was banned. <laughs> it was banned in New York City. They would take the pinball machines and throw them into the East River. And for some of the games, they would actually reuse the metal during World War II because they were short on materials. So it's interesting, pinball was considered a form of gambling up until the 70s where they overturned this law and it became legalized for all of us to play and have fun. Um, in certain areas, actually in Georgia, it is still considered a coin-operated game and you need a special license in order to have a pinball machine in your establishment. So Stern Pinball, which is based in Elk Grove, Illinois, they have an interesting business model because they have been a B2B company for over 50 years, and um, it's fascinating because what most don't know is that buying a pinball machine in the past was like buying a car. You would actually go to a dealership, a pinball dealership, to purchase a game. And there was a sales representative to support you. It wasn't something that you could necessarily purchase online. So you went to the dealer network to pick out your favorite game, and it's a very expensive purchase. These games range anywhere from $9,000 to $15,000. Um, it's a luxury transaction. It is kind of like buying a car going into this experience. And there are even mechanics that can work on your pinball game should it need repair. So Stern came to Moxie because they're interested in going direct to consumer, which was a big evolution for them in transitioning from this dealership model of B2B to B2C. And we went through this extensive process in understanding who their customer is. They came to us and shared that they felt that their customer, let me go ahead right here, they thought their customer was a single male in his mid-50s, unmarried, and they felt it was a one-off purchase. And when we went through our surveying process and interview process through quantitative data, we found out that it was not only men, but a mix of women too. The median age group was younger, was in their early 40s, high salary individual, and there is a huge audience, international audience, around pinball and pinball purchasing. Um, their careers fell heavily into the engineering category, and they have a deep love of collecting, um, as well as sports and technology. And so we started to go through the journey map stages. And this is a foundation that I would invite all of you to just adopt and take a screenshot when you're thinking about your customer, is that there is this five-step cycle of awareness, the consideration of your product or brand, making the decision to purchase or not, retain, and then hopefully becoming an advocate or a loyalist. So I think that, to me, this is the foundation of creating not only a story, but in pairing visual data Data. I'm going to share with you Roger, who is one of the customers that we uncovered as part of our journey together. And Roger is a fanatic collector. Um, I was surprised to find out when we were doing not only data research that we pulled from their dealer network, but also through interviews and research 
that many of these collectors have not one, not two, not 10, not 20, but 30 to 40 games. <laughs> they are collecting these things just like baseball cards and they trade the games, they you know, share them with uh, friends and family and bless their wives. I don't know how they find room for them in their house. But it's interesting because being a collector, there's a certain sense of pride with that. And this particular persona um, was very excited about sharing his love and nostalgia for pinball with his family. And given the investment in these games, um, they're highly collectible. It's something that he loved to share with his grandchildren and something he wanted to pass down to them. Um, so it was really fascinating to go through this process and truly understand wow, there is a fanatic collector who's collecting pinball machines. And we went through the mapping process of understanding the interests, like what you see here is a, is a buying cycle of a shopper in the user journey. And what you see is like the peaks and valleys of the shopping experience and where they are excited, where they are frustrated, where they may be deviating off the path. And again, creating a visual narrative to pair with the actual persona helps to give the marketing and sales teams like a very visual understanding of how a customer is shopping and where they're abandoning the site experience. So they're thinking much further than, oh, well, I have an abandoned cart rate of X percent. Well, why is that? And looking into these steps and questions as part of the process is so key. This is my favorite out of our find. Um, we actually found three different customer segments, but I wanted to share with you my favorite two. And um, the female demographic in the pinball community is absolutely amazing. And that Maggie, this persona, she's actually a professional pinball player. She plays competitively in international leagues and tournaments. And the interesting thing about Maggie is she's buying these games because it's part of her life. She's winning tournaments where she's $20,000, $30,000 cash prize, and so she's investing in these games as a tool for her to practice. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating. You know, she, Maggie, this persona, is a modern-day pinball wizard, and she started playing locally in her league. And she just became obsessed with the game and better and better, and her friends said, hey, why don't you join a tournament? And just in, like, professional sports, there is professional competitive pinball. Um, so this persona is super important because really this is an extension of her career and her passion and she's investing in these games as a way to continue to advance herself as a player. So um, I loved this persona when we were interviewing all of the, the different market segments and I was able to actually speak with one of the top competitive pinball players in the world and she has won 35 different tournaments, two that were international and it's pretty amazing, um, her career. I mean, she's making more money than most of us here in the room <laughs> playing pinball, uh, which is, is pretty amazing for a competitive sport. So I'll, I'll leave you with this question here. Like, if you don't have a story, a story around not only your brand, which I know most have stories around their brand, but about your customer, how do you intend to grow your business? We all have unique stories, and we all have a very special journey to share. So I think it's so important to think about the psychology of how we put ourselves in the customer's shoes in order to really connect with them further. Thank you so much. Questions? Yes. Sure. Yes, I'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah, the customer journey, and in order to get to that customer journey process, it was really a six month process to understand like the awareness up into becoming an advocate or a loyalist. And we've worked with many different clients in terms of understanding who their customers are and 
in the pinball community, certainly for some, it may be a one-off purchase, but for many of their personas, they are purchasing these games and they may be reselling them in order to purchase another. Like for example, Maggie, after she's done playing that game, Any other questions? I'm gonna ask questions. Does anyone, I see these two guys play pinball over here. Now, I'm gonna ask you guys, what are your favorite games? <laughs> okay, Gun, Guns N' Roses is great. Shrek, that's awesome. <laughs> I have a few favorite pinball games. I really love Elvira. There's actually three Elvira games. Elvira's Scared Stiff, Elvira and the Party Monsters, and Elvira's um, Haunted House of Horrors. Um, the cool thing about Stern, because they are the largest manufacturer of pinball machines, is that they are coming out with games um, about four times a year, four to five games a year. Um, games like Guns N' Roses, they've recently released Foo Fighters, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting journey to understand the different customers. I would definitely, so Decibel is an amazing company out of England. And as a strategist, it is my favorite tool in wrapping around humanistic data and to be able to show data visualization as part of a narrative storytelling. Um, there is no more powerful tool than Decibel, and it is expensive. You know, you're going to be spending quite a bit on that license, and it may not be something that every brand can necessarily invest in at first, and if not, that's okay. There's other tools such as Hotjar that you can utilize. It's, um, it will give you a similar approach, but not as rich from the visualization side. So I love Decibel. That is a tool I would definitely use. So as a suggestion, um, are they gonna sell parts as well to the direct to the consumer because they're pretty hard to come by? That, I think that is a great point and it is something that Stern has been grappling with with their dealer network. So typically um, everything has been going through the dealer. Previously you had to work with them to purchase a pinball machine and you mentioned the parts, it is a thing. There is a company called Marco who supports um, all of the parts for all the pinball games that Stern does not. So they kind of work hand and glove together because Stern does not release their um, parts necessarily to the public. They will release it within their dealer network. Um, but it's interesting, there are over 35,000 components that go into a pinball game. And I think it's over five miles of cables and wiring that go into the manufacturing of the games. And it's, they're all made in the United States, so it's part of the expense. As you can see, I get really into the brands I work with. I become the super shopper. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thanks all. Ah, right. one, one more, more will. Okay, so after you did the Stern um, mapping, what changes did they make based off the data that you provided them with? Sure, so this was their first foray in going into e-commerce. So as part of their e-commerce platform, we were able to create different silos within their shopping experience that would cater toward, towards that shopper. And one of my favorite things that came about this was something called the Insiders Club, which is an exclusive community for those who have purchased over two pinball games from Stern. And it is a club that you can join. And that was one of the, the coolest things that came out of the process. But I would say customization around the shopping experience online and also their email marketing. One of the biggest challenges is they were so focused on the dealer network, they didn't know how to speak to their end customer and understand, well, how do I connect with Maggie and Roger? They're totally two different people. Um, so creating market segmentation for their email was also part of this strategy. They have a long way to go, you know, they're, they're an older brand, so I've, I feel very honored that they have adopted what they can, and out of these experiences, there's anywhere from, I'd say 20 to 25, like, top, top things that retailers take away that they can implement, and 
I tried to boil it down at the end of things to about five because I realized that many teams are challenged with resources and they may not be able to implement everything that comes out of humanistic data or data visualization journey. Um, but even if you do one thing, I think it's a success. Are there any other questions? Thanks everyone for being so engaged. Thank you.